A few quick uh, announcements. Yeah. If you've been to our meetups before, you've heard all these announcements many times over. Uh, they're familiar, but I say them anyways because they're successful at, uh, at getting people to help us out. Um, and the, these announcements are that we're always SF Data Mining that, that organizes this along with Trulia. Uh, I happen, happen to work for both of them. And um, we're always looking for people to help organize. We have a really cool set of organizers. You can come uh, work with us. Uh, and. Um, you can you can help uh, you can help either organize events. You can help just identify speakers if that's something that interests you. Um, we're open to flying speakers in these days as well. Um, so if you have if you have leads, contacts, so on, um, that's great. Uh, if you have venues and you just want to contribute in that way, you work for some company you think that, that would uh, be a great place, even if it's much smaller than than Trulia, much larger, is even better, but much smaller. We have uh, we have certain topics which draws a more niche crowd. Um, that we can always host at other, other venues. Um, that's great, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, we're also always looking for either videographers um, or sponsors for videographers. So we offer for sponsorship, if you, you know, cover the cost of videographers, we'll, we'll put a slide in there that you know, send you sponsors and so on and, and meet, your, meet your needs that way. Um, that's the number one request we get from people always is uh, for audio and video. Uh, Tonight, uh, so we have obviously a couple of speakers from LinkedIn. Our next next scheduled meetup, um, looking up to October, is also a speaker from LinkedIn, uh, who um, well, we'll be posting that one in within the next 24 hours. Um, so I'll let these guys introduce themselves, and we'll just get started. Hi guys, I'm Vitaly, and I'm a senior data scientist at LinkedIn. I'm going to talk about most of the work that actually it's not me who's doing it, and it's Patrick, and let him introduce himself. And uh, I'm Patrick, I'm the crowdsourcing lead at LinkedIn, so I came in to basically build a crowdsourcing center of excellence there and make sure we're using it right and using it in the right places. Um, so we're gonna go through a series of projects, talk about if we use crowdsourcing, and if so, when, and if not, why not? Okay, so let's see if this thing works. Not work. Just want to use it without it. Yeah, it works. Awesome. Okay, so since it's a kind of late hour for everyone, and you guys don't want to hear us just talk. Um, yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, tough luck. So we're, uh, we're not gonna talk a lot. We just will basically do it as an dis open discussion. There are actually not too many of you, which is great. So. Um, we will share um, a lot of uh, <coughs> interesting stories we face with uh, data science um, at LinkedIn. And we called it hacking data science because hacking is an overused term. Data science is overused term. Both of them together are not so overused. Um, and basically, it's the things we do uh, in LinkedIn to make our life as data scientists uh, easier. And we'll present some use cases. We'll um, ask you some question, you will ask, ask some question, and we'll hopefully together we'll uh, learn something. So um, just to kind of make it clear, our, we, I did hear a sketch of a very basic uh, kind of ma uh, machine learning flow. You know, we gather some data, we engineer features, we'll do the modeling, evaluation, <coughs> and we kind of circle it together, and we will, um, touch only some of the points, mostly gathering the data and the evaluation. And I guess there are a lot of talks about you know, how to engineer a feature, how to uh, find the best model. We won't cover uh, this today. We will only focus on the first two. So let's start with our, our first story, which is uh, understanding seniority, which is something that is kind of um, Valuable LinkedIn, we make 60% of our revenue uh, from our recruiting solution, and you know seniority is something that we would like to understand um, how how to do right, uh, how to know that person X is, for example, more senior than person Y, or how senior is person X. So let's look at the use case. Here is one of my colleagues, and for those of you, you who don't see the small text, not very important. What it is kind of I want to point here is 
uh, Daniel Tankelang, who one of the person who leads search on LinkedIn, and he was uh, managing, managing the data science team up until a couple of months ago. Um, you can see, uh, spent most of his career as a chief scientist at a company called uh, Endeka. Uh, this company went uh, to be acquired by Oracle for I think, a little bit more than uh, one billion dollar, and his next position after being a chief scientist at Endeka, which by then was a pretty large company, was a tech lead uh, of local search at Google. So. For us uh, at LinkedIn, when we um, look at the signal, we try to understand, okay, well, is a tech lead at Google is a more senior position than a chief scientist at Endeka? Or maybe Daniel was demoted, and maybe he didn't do his job very well, and his next job wasn't as good. As you can see, after becoming a tech le uh, lead at Google, which is I guess it has some similarity. <coughs> Daniel um, had become a director of data scientists, uh, data science at LinkedIn, which again begs the question: uh, Is director of data science is a more senior position than a uh, tech lead at Google? And maybe also we're interested uh, to find out: Is kind of tra by transitivity, transitivity <coughs> rules? is the director of data science at Google, also more senior than chief scientist at Google. <coughs> and here's kind of my first question to you. Any ideas about like how can we infer whether technically that Google is, for example, is a more senior position than the chief scientist at the NECA or not? Yes. Salary. Salary. Yes. <laughs> Great indicator. And People move. Um, so one problem is also, if you can see, Daniel spent a lot of time uh, at the and I have no idea what, how his salary looked like, but it, it kind of affects, and most people also, uh, when they switch jobs, they get sell um, kind of higher compensation just because time went by and the market uh, was good enough. And but I guess the actually the more serious problem about it that LinkedIn doesn't have this data, right? So we we don't know um, the per a person's salary. It will be very very helpful for a lot of uh, our data products if you guys go all to LinkedIn and somehow enter your salary. We can do a lot of amazing stuff with it, but we don't have this data. Uh, any other ideas? Well, Applicants. I have more of a question. If there's the question of seniority within an organization, which is relative, and there's seniority within the context trajectory of a career, and then there's the notion of expertise. Right, which is that you're an expert within a given domain, and I think these are different questions you ask depending on what, what kind of what you're looking for. So that's so, how a, do you so that's a great uh, comment. Or if I can paraphrase, you say that basically seniority or pretty much everything else is also based on context, right? What is the context that we are asking for? So in this context, we can uh, try the following. So we <laughs> see, for example, before. Um, let's say you are a recruiter at Google and you are now uh, want to hire a person for a position of tech lead. So um, we want to train our algorithms to also su suggest the, mo the most relevant people uh, for you. And we want to know that, for example, chief scientists at companies like Indeca, which is, can mean a lot of uh, different things, but we want to suggest these people also as a viable candidate for, um, and maybe a director of data science at LinkedIn, which is, let's say, uh, higher seniority position uh, than a tech lead at Google, maybe we don't, and we don't want to uh, suggest to you as a recruiter, and if you are using LinkedIn, you can, uh, you also remember we have jobs you may be interested in uh, module, and we don't want to suggest, for example, for the records uh, at LinkedIn, we don't want to suggest tech lead roles uh, at Google. So in, in this context, it's um, kind of, that is why we need to understand it also between companies and not just within a certain company. Yes, there, yes, you. You can look at other people uh, and see their trajectory as well. I think just looking at one person and the, the labels over there is not gonna give you much information. I don't think you have enough on this page. But if you look at other people, for example, like Google, who um, are tech leads, one thing that would be helpful is looking at the internal promotions uh, to tech leads so you can get some sort of um, some sort of uh, ordering, first of all, within one company, and then you 
you might want to look at other companies and see the trajectory of people, other people who went into Google who were chief scientists and see um, how they get promoted within Google to get a sense of the order within Google. At least you'll be able to get a sense of relative seniority in terms of how Google views chief scientists uh, vis-a-vis -vis tech leads for other companies. You know, some relative degree given it. The same name, the same title can be very different. Okay, so that's actually also a great suggestion. We can look at many people that had a similar position and to see how their career trajectory went. And so kind of to go for our first, our, our first problem that companies, like we said, are not centered. Tech lead and director and chief scientist at every company uh, meets uh, something else. And also um, one of the problems with this approach that uh, not all of our, um, for example, tech lead local search, if we take this string as is, it probably will be a very, very sparse uh, position. And uh, we don't have too many people that have the exact same uh, title to learn from. But let's look at the um, next example, which kind of makes things even harder. Before uh, working on LinkedIn, uh, I was working at a company called LivePerson. And LivePerson does this uh, chat solution, but we have two employees at LivePerson, they were both. <coughs> uh, Mark was a vi vice president of Cloud from Technologies and Ecosystem, and Ido was VP, head of partner ecosystem, where both titles actually sound very, very similar. And the question here is, even within the same company, sometimes let's say I'm looking to hire my next CEO and I think I know, you know, a live person is a great company, and I think I know that the person I want to hire uh, needs to be a CEO, but let's say relatively senior CEO, uh, sorry, vice president, and not a very um, junior uh, vice president. So this is also kind of a problem that um, we need to tackle, that just titles are not enough. Any idea about how can we use, yes? Maybe seeing the projects that you work with. I mean, for for a Twitter, uh, it's a better, better indication if I saw like you worked on similar projects that I'm looking for. Well, well even though I I kind of I agree that the projects is a great indication in hiring. There are multiple, but I, I'm saying just in terms of seniority, let's say between zero and one. Um, I forget about the content and use the behavior towards these positions when they're posted. Uh, well, like, like for example, when, the, when a tech lead is posted at Google, you get a sense of how much demand is out there among people who have other titles and so on. Mm -hmm. so yeah. It links into the competition. So it's also kind of a one thing. And there are kind of multiple ways we try to tackle and think about it. And just uh, there will be a lot of other questions I, I will get to ask, so everyone will hopefully get, will, uh, will get to participate. Uh, one of our data scientists, uh, Mar Mario Rodriguez, actually came up with uh, what I think is a pretty ingenious solution. He actually found that we have some of this uh, data. And if you look, uh, here is the recommendation that um, Ido uh, gave to Mark. Can you spot the key word in this re recommendation? What is the word? Reported. Exactly. Reported. So now, if we, uh, when we uh, give recommendation uh, on LinkedIn, we actually specify our connection to, uh, to this person. We say, I don't, I don't remember how many options, but basically report directly, report indirectly, work closely with, work with another company. There are not too many, but they're pre-serialized. Uh, there are not too many of them. And if we take the entire uh, LinkedIn recommendation, we have about a few millions of them. And we can actually start um, using a kind of very nice, um, build a very nice graph of people that we know are senior to another and kind of use a pairwise comparison algorithms to infer uh, at least some initial uh, labels at four, uh, how can we infer seniority? And that's actually um, gave us kind of the first step of trying to figure out this problem, which was uh, very helpful. But again, if we go back to Daniel and Monica, we can see that here is a, a recommendation that Daniel gave to Monica Gatti. And here uh, it says not so long ago that, so you can see this recommendation is fairly recent. 
So Daniel managed Monica at LinkedIn, but Monica, meanwhile, stopped working at LinkedIn and actually got a new job where her title is Vice President of Data, which kind of um, screws up um, our algorithms in the sense that uh, we also just need to pay uh, a lot of attention to how we build this data, and, uh, build with this data, and not take things too literally, and kind of try to get a snapshot of what uh, what were their titles uh, at exact exact time where um, the recommendation was given, and presents kind of an uh, interesting data challenges now that I won't bore you with. But I am, I'm just saying, even though we kind of found a cool solution uh, for it, still we, uh, you know, it doesn't solve everything and we still need to work around. Let's look at the kind of uh, second example that I want to go through. And it's um, learning to target better. Um, as you can see, that is kind of a, uh, yeah, an example where context matters. Um, and one thing we also try to do, uh, for all of you who have LinkedIn uh, profile, you probably remember that you never entered your gender. And, but, but we have your names. And you know, we say, OK, well, can we use names to infer your gender? Because, uh, for example, for our ad targeting stuff, we have customers that are interested in um, this uh, specific facet in order to uh, do their targeting. Um, any ideas about how can we infer gender? Well, the text on the recommendations, he or she. That's a great idea. And actually, that is uh, one of our data scientists. From Ash, let's look again at Monica's recommendation by Daniel. You will see. So, pretty obvious. Monica is a she. Well, but kind of um, is it? Um, anyone knows who this is? Wow, really, no one. It's a Beverly Hills 9210 character. Her name was. Andrea Zuckerman, maybe I will have more luck with my second guest. Anyone knows who this is? Right, Andrea Bocelli. So, probably figured out they both have the same name. And when we look at, um, so again, uh, recommendation data is not enough. We need a little bit more context. And uh, when Ganesh uh, ran his profiling on the names from recommendation, he plotted them uh, on a map and he got this very interesting graph. As you can see, there are some countries, especially Italy, when Andrea is a male name and not a female. Um, and we have, again, another guy, everyone knows who this is, and this one. Also, her name is Robin as well. And here is how Robin, apparently in most of the world, Robin is a, I think it's a female name, while in the United States it's mostly a male name. And also we had this. Uh, speak louder, please. Stand up. Sorry, yeah, I will speak to the microphone a more. Um, so Robin, and that is only one thing that we have this geographical uh, problems with it. And again, last slide, do you know the name of the actor? Dana. The name of this actor? Stacy Keach, yes. So Dana and Stacy were names that historically at least were used by men. I don't think anyone named, uh, naming boys a lot, well maybe Dana, but uh, not a lot of Stacy boys anymore. And this is another problem that, again, um, kind of the point here that uh, I was trying to make is we need to, um, even though that we have uh, some data that can you know, label us, we, we need to kind of treat those labels carefully. But kind of the larger point here is the, the cheapest form of crowdsourcing is actually no crowdsourcing. Sometimes, if you look kind of carefully, um, 
you can find the answer on your nose, and sometimes it just uh, hides so somewhere in your data. And now I'll leave Patrick to tell you a little bit more about uh, cases where we actually use crowdsourcing. Awesome. So the first lesson is if you want to use crowdsourcing, maybe you just shouldn't. Maybe look a little bit carefully. Maybe you have the data there. Uh, but now we actually are going to talk about crowdsourcing. Um, out of curiosity, how many people have actually used Mechanical Turk? All right, so a few. Uh, leave your hands up. How many people would say they were successful in using Mechanical Turk? Eh, ish, right? It's good, but it's kind of hard. Um, and so I'm going to go through a couple of ways that you can use Mechanical Turk maybe more successfully, a couple of best practices of places where we've used crowdsourcing and how we got it to work. Um, for this first example, we're going to talk about spam. Hopefully this is fairly self-explanatory, but we have influencer content. They're publishing this material, treating LinkedIn as a platform for information exchange, giving you the, the content that you need to be more successful in your career. Um, because that influencer content is publicly visible, it attracts more of the spammers, right? So clearly that's not a great thing. It kind of lowers the perceived value of LinkedIn. Um, and those people that are leaving these comments are by and large LinkedIn members, so we can't necessarily just ban them outright. So how can we be a little bit more clever about telling if a specific piece of content is spam or not spam? Um, we did have a bunch of already labeled data um, from previously identified spammers, but we wanted to be a little bit smarter about it. So we took our existing classification algorithm and sampled kind of along the uh, decision margin. Said, all right, we'll, we'll train on those. <coughs> uh, but the first problem is that binary tasks are kind of hard, right? And they're hard in the sense that they're actually way too easy. Um, if you've ever done this crowdsourcing, you maybe have had this problem, but if the question is just sort of yes or no, is this comment spam or not spam, there's not a huge difference between someone who's doing really good work and someone who's guessing, especially if they're only doing a little bit of work, right? Um, so you need a little bit more of a signal, and the way you do that usually is by increasing the number of, sort of possible labels. So a lot of times that'll be, is it spam? Yes, and if so, you know, what kind of spam or no? Uh, so like yes, if, no, but, that kind of thing. Um, second challenge is that it's kind of hard to tell if something is spam, right? So if you look at these, none of these are like amazingly high quality comments, right? Nice, sure. Um, this one actually is totally relevant, but if you just read it in isolation, you might not know that. Um, so we kind of figured, well, yeah, you need to know the original piece of content, but you also need to see a lot of these pieces of content uh, together. Uh, so hopefully this is kind of an obvious lead up that the way we designed this task was just to do that, right? So we've uh, grouped a bunch of these comments together. Um, <clears throat> we provided the original source of content, and then we had people flag any comment that was or was not spam. Um, so far, so good, right? Except that we still have an extremely biased data set. Um, even when we're sampling where we think there's a lot of spam, you know, best case, maybe it's 20% spam. It probably is going to be a lot less than that. Um, so how do you calibrate a task to maximize quality is anyone done crowdsourcing? Do you have any ideas about sort of strategies you use to, to ensure quality? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, some, some plurality majority voting system. Uh, that's definitely right. It's sort of the meat of, uh, well, we'll call it one half of the meat. And then anyone else? Maybe the other side in the back? Uh, gold, labels. gold labels, yeah. So. Gold labels and multiple judgments is like the meat and potatoes, how you get your quality. Um, but, okay, well what if, how do you set the distribution of gold labels if you don't know what the underlying distribution is of data in your data set, if you think it's really biased, so you don't want people to be able to guess their way through, how do you really differentiate between good and bad workers? You know, in general, you want to have a roughly even distribution of uh, items in your gold set. In this case, we biased it pretty heavily towards spam. Uh, just because spam was so uncommon in the set. Um, and then we got multiple ju uh, judgments on each item, and we treated any, any comment that got at least one vote as kind of suspect. If it got a plurality of votes, great, we know it was spam. And then kind of pipe those into another workflow where we give them a second pass to make sure, you know, are they really spam or are they not spam? Um, what are we using it for? It's pretty straightforward, I think, other than there's no information there. but. We're training a new uh, feature set or evaluating a new set of features. So how can we maximize our recall without sacrificing too much precision? 
Um, and we added a bunch of features, variations, testing it, and using crowdsourcing to basically test uh, which one of these new implementations is going to work better. Um, sort of a sense of scale, we labeled, you know, I think around 20,000 comments for a few hundred bucks um, in 48, 72 hours, something like that. Um, so this stuff is really powerful if you pick the right problems and sort of approach it the right way. Um, big takeaway here, right, is think about the problem you're trying to solve and sort of structure it in a way that makes it help or easy for you to actually get reasonable data back um, out of the crowd. Anybody have any questions about, about spam before we move on to the next little story? <coughs> Great. Uh, so the next one is channels, right? And if you've seen these on LinkedIn, hopefully you have. We have, I don't know, hundreds of channels now. And they're topics, and we're trying to find, again, relevant content for you, a LinkedIn user, so you come back, you spend more time on the site, you interact more, and everyone's happy. Um, but we need this to be timely, we need it to be relevant, and we need it to be relevant across many different topics. Um, so the team came to the crowdsourcing corner of LinkedIn and said, all right, let's crowdsource this stuff. We don't know where to get these labels otherwise. And the first idea was, all right, we'll just look at some articles, we'll tag them with topics, and we'll see what happens. Uh, you can probably guess, if you've done this at all, the problem here is there's a problem of consistency, right? If we all read the same article, we'll probably come up with 20 different topics, even if we're picking from a standardized set of topics. There's just too many ways to interpret the main point of this article. Um, and that is expensive, right? Because crowdsourcing is inexpensive if you do it right, but it can, the cost can add up pretty fast. Another alternative would be to set up some complex multi-stage workflow where you get some labels and you pass them to another group, have them validated and have them ranked, and then, and then yeah, that would work too, but it, it was kind of more work than we wanted to do. Um, so how do we get around this problem? Um, we actually have a pretty, I think, interesting solution. And the team said, well, why don't we just, is it, well, let's find a way to, um, to suggest topics, right? So what topics might be relevant for a specific article? At a most basic level, I'm sure you guys are kind of guess how this is going to work, but we trained a sort of weak classifier to infer the main topic. And in this one, right, machine learning, machine learning, machine learning, all right. <laughs> it's a pretty easy jump to say this topic. This article may be about machine learning. And then because these were all skills that we were using out of LinkedIn, we can use the skills data. Um, so we have sort of co-occurrence of all the different skills. Use that to expand these query sets. <laughs> and then essentially generated a, a set of 100 possible topics for each article. Um, now this is actually pretty awesome because what we can do at the end is say, all right, here's an article, here's a topic, and then do sort of a very standard relevance evaluation, right? Um, I think in a later iteration of the task, we turned it to like primary topic, secondary topic, and not at all relevant. Um, but using this data, we can go back and we can see which topics are relevant, which are not, and then eventually retrain on that data to build these classifiers for these hundreds of different channels. Um, um, this one, consensus, that was a big point. And we were trying to think, okay, how do we, uh, how do we get a, a clean label? Uh, gold, you know, you obviously you want to use gold all the time. Um, and this one, we're thinking, does it make a lot of sense? Like if we have two people saying primary topic and two people saying secondary topic, do we really want to resolve that disagreement? in the sense that, well, I mean, is that in itself a useful enough signal? We can say that's a 2.5. Um, we decided it probably was, so we didn't do anything fancy with sort of multiple judgments or variable judgments or confidence intervals. We just said, give us four for each. We'll use gold to filter out a lot of the bad people and uh, see what quality looks like. Uh, quality looks pretty good, but sort of the next quality lesson here, sort of like not by gold alone. Um, and so this, this is gonna show worker accuracy on gold on the bottom. Those are those expert labels that you've created in-house. And then their agreement with other workers on the top. If you look up here, you kind of see the shape that you would hope for, right? As they get better on gold, they get better in agreement with other workers, right? Except for this little cloud of folk down here in the bottom. And they are somehow really bad on the items where we know the answer, or really good on the items where we know the answer and really bad compared to everyone else. So maybe they're really good and everyone else is bad. It turned out in this case and in most cases that's not what's going on. Um, they've either learned gold or they somehow identified how you're testing them and um, co-opted that. So that is a problem. You can get around it by creating a lot more gold. Uh, gold creation is kind of cumbersome. People might say it's like undoable. The reality is you don't have to do that much. Um, maybe five or ten examples for each class 
and then once you run a small set, you can bootstrap additional gold out of there, right? So you look at items that four or five people looked at, they all agreed that this is highly relevant, great, we'll use that as gold and spit it out. Um, so if someone says, you know, gold creation is gonna take me four hours, it defeats the whole purpose of crowdsourcing, uh, don't believe it, basically. The, the most time consuming part is inevitably pulling the data out and then analyzing it at the end. Gold creation is sort of like debugging, right? You're looking at individual rows. You might find out, if we go back to this task, one thing we didn't know was that even though we were only pulling uh, articles in English, there were a lot of articles that weren't in English, right? And we didn't know that until we looked at individual items for evaluation. Similarly, there were a lot, this is actually not an article, this is a job description. Um, we didn't know that those were getting incorrectly tagged as articles. Um, and so it was that hour or two that we spent creating gold by hand that actually taught us that like, this is the way that your data is not what you expect it to be. Um, and that's actually immensely valuable. In the same way that you're gonna test your code and debug your code. Think of digging gold as uh, that debugging process. Um, again, what do we use it for? Uh, this is evaluating our existing classification framework. There's a paper that'll come out hopefully soon where the engineers talk about all the very clever ways they use to uh, extend this across all the other topics. Um, here, needless to say, it's very clever, it's very over my head, but it seems like it works really well. Um, the big takeaway here, I think, is, is be helpful, right? Help your helpers, and think about, again, like what's a task that someone could agree on, or a lot of people could agree on, particularly with a very minimal spin of time, and if you can get your task sort of into that realm, uh, you'll have a lot more success and a lot less pain. Any questions about um, channels classifiers and helping helpers? All right, so we'll do one more. Uh, this is about search. Um, LinkedIn search, as you can imagine, major portal information on the site. Uh, it helps you find people, it helps you be found by people. Um, you search for people, you search for jobs, you search for groups, content. It's sort of this very holistic way of tying together all parts of the site and giving you information that's relevant to you, which is sort of the core value of LinkedIn, right? We want you to go there to improve your career. Um, challenge with that, especially with people, right, is that it's highly personalized. So if I search for architect, I might get, you know, the guy who built my house. I'm telling you, might get the guy who's a software, you know, software engineer, architect. Um, similarly, Kevin Scott, uh, VP of engineering at LinkedIn, is only one of many Kevin Scotts that are on LinkedIn with profiles, and they're all within one degree of separation from me. So how do we pick among that for a highly personalized search? Um, Usually, traditionally, when you're doing search relevance evaluation, you can use crowdsourcing and it works pretty well. Um, you can imagine if you're looking at eBay search results and I say, I searched for iPad mini and I got an iPad mini case. It doesn't take a whole lot of sort of cognitive weight to say that's probably not quite right. Um, there are more complicated cases. Maybe you're looking for like car parts and it's kind of esoteric stuff, but it can be done. In this case, it's really a tuple, right? There's the user, there's the query, and there's a the document. So can I really ask you to say, okay, pretend that you're a LinkedIn employee, you're searching for this name, it, it's not gonna work. Even if you sort of abstract at a level and say, all right, pretend you're a plumber and you searched for antique pipe installation, are you really gonna be able to differentiate between the different people that come up? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, so the very fine-grained relevance that you usually use for this with NDCG scores and all that kind of falls apart with uh, this highly personalized search. So what do we do? We train from the logs and that works pretty well. Um, but we can still do some evaluation. There's a number of measures that we use. There's click-through rate at one, right? There's click-through on page one. You can look at session abandonment. Um, but what about explicit relevance measures, the things that you know, Google has an army of people doing and Amazon sort of invented Mechanical Turk to do? Um, how do we do that with crowdsourcing? Anybody have any ideas of ways that we could try to measure explicitly the relevance of search? Somebody's got to have one idea. You know, but we're not telling you. <laughs> well, I know, because I've got another slide. Um, <laughs> that's right, no, it's, it's WTF at one, right? Um, so we said, all right, well, let's take some very unpersonalized results in the sense that we're not going to ask you if it's somewhat relevant, highly relevant, extremely relevant, or perfect. We just want to know if it's, like, totally wrong, right? Um, so... Uh, we looked at, we sampled among these queries where there was no click on the first result to be, you know, we actually don't care if like we're getting good results most of the time. We want to know where we're not getting good results 
and get some running measure of that. So queries where number one didn't get a click and then made sure they weren't like first name, last name queries. They completely matched the, uh, the profile. Um, so within this subset, um, looking at these queries that we think might not perform that well. And then we also did, again, sort of expanding beyond a simple binary task. Um, we're kind of tagging what kind of query it was, right? So is it a job? Is it a company? That's helpful because we have a whole query understanding uh, infrastructure that puts tags on these queries so we can get kind of a two-for-one audit. Um, and it really just gives us this explicit relevance measure that we can look at over time. So is this WTF rate, is it going up, is it going down? And then we can sort of dig into the ones where we see that this is completely wrong and see what's going on. It's actually helped us identify the kinds of ways that these queries go wrong and um, hopefully help us to put together a solution. Um, so another way of doing uh, quality with crowdsourcing, you have gold, you have agreement, you have redundancy. Um, but there's also a whole another category of behavioral metrics. Um, this is a very simple one, but it's looking on the X, sort of how long it took you to do a task, and on the Y, sort of how often you agreed with the aggregate answer at that task. And I was actually shocked when I saw this. Right? It, it sort of goes with what your intuition would be, but that doesn't always work. But as they're going really fast, their quality is pretty lousy. And then as it moves up, it eventually stables off, and the stuff out at the end is just noise. But if you look at the, the volume tab under here, right, you can see that there's some subset of people that are going really fast and they're just doing like, terrible work. Um, so we can use that to probably set a minimum task time. But you can think of a bunch of other behavioral metrics that you could look at, right? So judgment duration, but you could also look at scrolls and clicks. You could look at um, sort of the time spread between judgments. Are they always taking between four and a half and five and a half seconds, or do they have some at two and some at nine? trying to identify these bots that different kind of workers might fall into. Um, so yeah, that's you know jQuery. You can actually do a lot of this stuff without a whole lot of uh, technical ability, meaning that I can actually do it. Um, but the takeaway here right, is like pick a solvable problem. Um, so don't ask someone to do something that, for example, you couldn't do within your team. Um, we have a lot of examples of these that we may or may not uh, get into. but. You know, it's like if, if you can't explain to me how to do it or if you can't expect the five people on the search team to come to the same uh, answer, like that's not a crowdsourceable problem. It's actually not a solvable problem. Um, so reset. Think about what's going on, right? And can you find a parallel problem that's actually solvable and relatively straightforward and uh, focus your efforts on that? Uh, another cool takeaway on this one, we ran this internally and externally. So within the LinkedIn search team and with sort of the crowdsourcing world at large, and the results were nearly identical. And to the extent that we could see differences, there seemed to be fewer false positives with the crowdsourcing uh, workers. So it was a lot faster, it was a lot less annoying, and it seemed to be, if not more accurate, at least as accurate. Um, so this is sort of the takeaway here, right? It's also, if you hear someone complaining about how crowdsourcing doesn't work, it didn't work for me, whatever, that, you know, it just doesn't work. Like back up, um, if your code doesn't work, it, it might not be the language, right? It may be a, something that you've done. So you can get good quality out of crowdsourcing, but you have to do sort of these few sort of simple tips and tricks. Um, before we send it back to Vitaly for some more of these non-crowdsourcing um, examples, are there any questions about gold or agreement for sort of behavioral metrics and multiple judgments and these different sort of schemes of managing quality for anonymous distributed workers? Mm -hmm. Did you guys do any of that? Yeah, with, with seniority and with gender, we started the conversation with, with crowdsourcing. And yeah, I mean, we could have looked at pictures, but not everyone has a picture, so there were some limitations there. And with seniority, it was like, well, how do we want to measure? Do we want to put it in buckets and say, you know, there's five levels, or there are three levels, or there are ten levels, or do this pairwise evaluation? And as we were kind of debating about what's the best way to do this, somebody realized that actually we have this data, so let's train on that, uh, on the recommendations data, and then we evaluated it with uh, crowdsourcing, a sort of a large-scale audit, and it looked really good. And uh, any ideas on how Google does my gender, or is that why they have Google Plus to get your conversation? Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you how they do it, but if they, they could probably tell a lot from your Gmail and your Google Plus and everything else, but actually how they do that, I don't know. Uh, which uh, do you use to do crowdsourcing? To do the crowdsourcing. 
So we use Crowdflower, uh, full disclosure, I've worked at Crowdflower before LinkedIn, but we essentially license the platform. So we don't have to build these sort of basic things. Right? We don't build gold, we just use their evaluation, gold set. Um, multiple judgments, that's all built in. Um, not all of it, you know, the behavioral stuff we do on top, a lot of the agreement stuff we do on top, but sort of the, <coughs> the basic infrastructure of crowdsourcing, we just license it, because frankly it wasn't worth our time to, to build it from scratch, it was gonna be way more expensive. Did you have a question? Mm-hmm. What's your percentage of those people with sparse information and people who actually need a little more details? Yeah, sparse profiles are, are definitely a challenge. I think we talk about that in the uh, in the next example, so I'll punt that one to Vitaly, but you know, definitely there's there's problems with crowdsourcing if the profile doesn't have any information in it. And in the beginning we talked a little bit about seniority, you know, people with you know very limited profiles. But by looking at other information about them, we could infer stuff that wasn't in the profile explicitly and tell sort of how senior they were. Any examples where crowdsourcing didn't work where you thought it would? Ooh, uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of these didn't work the first time. We did a, a big project at finding um, sort of SEO spam, profile spam. And that one was really challenging for a number of reasons. I mean the spammers are good at what they do, right? So they didn't want to be caught by the LinkedIn admins. So they hid their SEO spam in, in clever and interesting ways that we actually can't talk about because we don't want them to know that we know. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, those are really fun, right? When you have this adversarial relationship between the task you want to do and the data you have to work with. Um, so it is sort of a cat and mouse game and we do stuff and they do stuff and, yep. Good question. Uh, no clue. That was basically the different methods that the um, relevance guys were using to take those labels and infer sort of more information beyond that. But I don't know if that is the same algorithm that you're talking about. Um. Did you have to train your workers before you let them into the system? Yeah, that's another thing that we just licensed from Crowdfire. So we use Gold to do basically an upfront task. Um, so you have to establish that you're over some threshold of accuracy on those gold labels. And then once you do, we let you in and we track you sort of in real time on every, some selection of judgments that you submit. We're testing you with gold and with these agreement and other metrics. But essentially we've built in that upfront training. And we, at this point, haven't had to go down the route of building a specialized crowd of people. Um, it's really nice if you don't have to do that because you get all the sort of flexibility of we have a new task and it's not like any other task and we want it done soon. So rather than building out some perfect crowd of people, we just have these quality control metrics that work pretty well in near real time to filter good people from bad people. Uh, yeah, here in the middle. Uh, how do you figure out how much to pay the workers and uh, does that have an impact on the quality of results? Yeah, pay is interesting. It, it, it tends to be sort of iterative and sort of magical that some of it depends on what overall volume there is in the system in like the entire crowdsourcing marketplace. Um, so if for some reason you know, you're coming up on someone else who's got a whole lot of data, you may have to pay a little bit more. Um, but you're really, you're balancing when you need it by, I mean, that's the main lever. Um, quality is interesting. If you do all your quality control right, there shouldn't be too much of a difference in quality, um, meaning that we haven't systematically been able to recreate quality differences based on pay, as long as you're not paying too little. Um, and if you pay a lot, you tend to attract the most motivated and nefarious crowdsourcing guys. So, you know, you don't want to pay like 10 bucks a hit either. Um, there's one in the back and then let's give it to Vitaly and we can pick it up. Uh, I have Oh, pay, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so let's give it back to Vitaly. <coughs> Well, it was a long slide to kind of look at without uh, context. And this is actually an excerpt 
from a, a LinkedIn guide to recruiters about how to use our search. And there are various uh, Boolean qu queries there. And here's the part that explains how to you know, do or in order to solve a specific problem. And, and you can see that's the kind of smart test, I guess, recruiter on our platform know that uh, people People use different titles that basically mean the same things. And for me as a data scientist, it kind of makes me sad <laughs> to see actually that people need to go and write this Boolean or queries in order to get um, um, to found what they need. Basically that sales executive and account executive are, uh, are the same. And uh, so we had a special project that we also said, okay, well, let's stop uh, recruiting using this, um, these methods because we definitely can help them in order uh, and standardize our titles. Um, any ideas about how one can go about it? How can we standardize titles, basically infer that account executive and sales executive are the same people and account exec and etc. Synonym as in a, like a compiled list of uh, synonyms. Yeah, that's one thing. Um, yeah, but how do we know that it's the same one? Oh, well, that. That's true. There? Uh, LinkedIn is a network. You could leverage uh, people's close connections as colleagues would tend to connect to people at the same position. That's true. We can, it, you know, people tend to flock with people or with similar titles. Um, definitely. Anyone else? Yes? Look at the queries of the users. Users might. So for, yeah, uh, to make it kind of clear, it's basically using sessions as an indication that the person, uh, search session as an indication that the user was uh, using the same, uh, looking for the same. Uh, probably a good UX trick is when they're inputting their profile, you type ahead. Like, so provoke them to type VP account executive versus a shortcut. That's true. And that is actually a good point on a kind of broader subject that I forgot to mention that, um, crowdsourcing in data and data science go hang, hand in hand as you know a complementary solution to make an offering better, but design is definitely also uh, one of them. If we design our interface right, then you know all of our jobs uh, will be easier. And for example, uh, today we have type ahead for the um, what users enter to the profile in the first place, and not only in search, and that encourages them to use actually standardized data and uh, not to try to type something else on. Uh, of course, it, it not always works. Some people just want to be called account execs, right? But uh, at least we uh, make it easier f for us. Um, was there an idea here? Yes. Are you doing anything with uh, hiring history and two different people, two different titles that hire in the same role? Right? So two different, two different people that were hired to the same role. Um, how did? different titles and city but how how do I know they were hired for the same role? Well, tracking their history over time. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah, we can look at people that have a similar history, and we also have a yes. Uh, maybe also the job descriptions. Uh, if job seekers are clicking through uh, job descriptions that have slightly different position names. <coughs> That's true. Uh, we we can also use JavaScript, and we can actually use a lot of data. For example. We have skills, we can infer the similar skills and networks, and a lot of, basically, it's a pile of features. But uh, because, since it's a kind of crowdsourcing thought, um, we also try to crowdsource uh, this information, okay. And to your previous question about um, was there, uh, were there a crowdsourcing task that didn't go well? So I can say that the same as with modeling, probably the first iteration of any of our tests did not go as well as 
we should. And the same as with modeling, we try to apply one model, see what doesn't work, and try to improve it. The same was here. So kind of that is uh, what we tried. Um, we first tried um, the first question. And it was kind of hard, right? Because uh, especially if you get, um, let's say, professions from you know medical uh, industry or um, law or something like that, and then we ask a completely random person, okay, you know, what's a kind of super title name for uh, this title? And you know, and we just didn't get. Um, very good result. The second question, as uh, as you can all see, is actually much much simpler. And here is also we uh, kind of going back to uh, lessons that were mentioned by Patrick as well. We did some legwork here. So uh, our uh, data scientist uh, Ahmed Bude, he, he uh, worked out uh, basically some unsupervised learning. He first clustered uh, all the uh, titles using all the metrics you, you just mentioned. And then um, kind of did the uh, title similarity and found the mean title of uh, every cluster and then used it to uh, extract what can be a potential candidate for the name of that cluster. So for the example before, it can be an account executive or a sales executive, just uh, which, uh, whichever one is more common. And uh, we use that as a proposal for our uh, turkers. And now it became from just labeling. It's actually started to become an ev evaluation. But with some, uh, again, given we spent some time on it, but we got an orders of magnitudes better results than our uh, first iteration. And kind of, um, again, it's keep it simple. Um, so our final example before we finish will be um, something that we also do, ranking skills. It's kind of a joke from the internet about uh, who is the person who, uh, you know, the best at bas basketball. And let me show you the first, uh, the first attempt. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, we have a skills page that you can go. And on the skills page, you can see skills. And Patrick mentioned the related skills, and you can see also like the top 10 or top 20 people uh, at, at that skill, where they work, uh, which geography are, are, are they in. And we basically try to learn um, for this. So here is uh, our first attempt at skill ranking. So we gave uh, our uh, crowdsourcing, uh, this is uh, actually Ahmed's profile, uh, the guy from the uh, title standardization. And we try to say, okay, how good Ahmed is at being a data scientist or being a, you know, a data mining special or machine learning. And again, to be honest, I think the first time we probably uh, set up a task that was not really, um, not, not uh, only it wasn't suitable for crowdsourcing, it's actually, I really don't know how to answer that, right? If you, we give you a scale from one to 10, and by this context alone, well, granted they also had education, well, you can see it here and maybe some skill data, it's very, very hard to answer uh, this question, okay, how good this person is at a certain skill. So we try, you know, we have a lot of smart guys working for us, so, uh, you know, we re realize that something is wrong here. So we did a second attempt. And here we actually compare, again, the same data scientist to another data scientist uh, that is working uh, uh, at the LinkedIn team. And now we ask, okay, and uh, for those of you who've seen the um, social network movie, it's like the hot or, hot or not or uh, for data scientists, um, which one is better, the right or the left one? And again, um, knowing both of these people and working, um, working with them closely, I still find it hard to answer uh, this question. I, I, because, um, you know, there is multiple ways to define what is be, being good at data science means, right? And especially when we now take a person that doesn't know these people and uh, also not necessarily data scientists, and it's really not a lot of information to actually uh, answer this question. 
So our third attempt will say, well, we know some people who are good at some stuff. And here is, um, you know, I uh, like the uh, programming language Scala very much. You can see the sticker on my laptop. And Martin Rodersky is the creator of Scala. So we can say, okay, well, maybe we can use this person as, you know, our baseline for to evaluate people who are good at something, which is, for example, Scala. But um, the problem is, it's very hard to actually generate a, a very extensive data set uh, for people who are good at something. And if I have uh, uh, Martin Lundersky for Scala and I take some people who wrote book uh, in, about Scala or maybe are active in the community or somehow generate a list for every skill, I'm afraid that I um, kind of uh, might get the problem that, you know, my classifier will tell me that EPFL professors are very good at Scala which is something that definitely can happen by having uh, um, only one. So, um, and again, to kind of uh, paraphrase the question that I uh, asked, it's, um, I assume most of you uh, here are data mining people and you definitely work uh, with data, other data mining pe people. So when you uh, think about comparing two of your peers to each other, it's not easy to answer, okay, what, uh, what is the feature uh, I'm looking for? And probably there is no uh, one single feature. But that is why it's not a very uh, good question uh, just to ask. But uh, any ideas about like how uh, how uh, uh, is it possible to solve that question about like who are the best people? Statistics is a degree, college degree, that might be a factor. Yeah, it says the first education, right? Um. Um, I would imagine you weight them. Um, the number of endorsements could be you know, valuable, statistics, knowledge could be valuable, communication skills, well, perhaps a lot of people have that that's not sort of defined, and so you could, you could do a, a weight. You know, but how, uh, how would they kind of come up with the weights, right? Uh, because I, I need to train against some label set in order to come up and. Um, here. Very similar. So, for example, I find a similar crowdsourcing expert, Patrick, and what do I do? So, you know, it's almost like um, when you take two different data sets, you kind of compare apples and oranges, you know, like uh, these different names. You try to find our titles and like, different positions and stuff. If you find somebody who has something very similar and you can somehow find differences between them, you can say, oh, maybe this qualitative difference. It's not to say anything. So uh, just for these of you who do not hear if I understand correctly, is finding people who are kind of close enough to each other that it will be easier to co to compare them. Uh, yeah. Any other? Yes. Oh, yeah, how about let the recruiter decide what's important? Because I might care about three of those and not four of the others, so we add that to my search tool. Well, that's, uh, that's true about um, um, kind of we can use some type of tweaking, it's a, but I assume, and again, this list, probably if we are gonna ask everyone in the audience, um, you know, everyone will have a, will have a different answer. Uh, so um, there is actually, it was a startup, I don't know exactly what happened with it, that uh, did a kind of cool uh, thing on top of LinkedIn uh, API, I think it was, the name was Mixtent, that they actually g <coughs> gave you uh, two of your friend uh, connections to, uh, and you chose between them uh, regarding a certain skill. So they ask you, you know, is uh, your friend X better than your friend Y at some sort of skill? And then when they have had a lot of uh, pairwise comparison, they kind of used it in order to generate some ranking for you uh, between your friends. And there was also kind of gamification aspect of it, which is, uh, I have no idea how accurate their data was, but uh, at least as a product, it was uh, kind of fun for people to use. And I think they they were mostly using it to kind of uh, drink your LinkedIn profile, by just giving the, um, you a game to play. But um, I, I think we try, and we, we the examples I've uh, tried to illustrate were actually um, examples where we tried crowdsourcing and and it didn't work uh, as well as we thought. Uh, 
And kind of when we thought about it uh, the second time, we realized, okay, maybe the task was just not right. And crowdsourcing is not a, you know, a magic solution that finally, it, that suddenly gives you kind of a magic uh, labels and you just, you know, everything is left is just applying your uh, classification model. So our kind of final uh, statement is, you know, more bad data does not equal better data. So it's not that if uh, you get more labels suddenly, um, the, classifier, uh, the classifiers uh, will uh, start to perform better. And what's actually uh, the worst thing about uh, the label generation phase is there is no way to know it. With, mo with modeling techniques, we can pretty much know with holdout set, you know, how accurate our model is. But if we got it wrong uh, during the labeling, then you know, we can have a perfect mo model that just tells us nothing. So since we're kind of running out of time and everyone's tired and want to go home, I will just summarize uh, the main lesson that we learned uh, doing crowdsourcing tasks uh, at LinkedIn. <coughs> is the first one is, again, try to use uh, the data you already have. In most cases, uh, we can find something that is somewhat, cor somewhat correlated to the problem we are trying. So, Second one is, again, keep it simple. The workers are not uh, people that will do all the work for you. So try to do something, like at the very least, try to give them a problem that you would be able to solve yourself. Um, again, that's free. Help your helpers is sometimes, uh, especially we as a data scientists, need to do some legwork in order to make this task. And kind of when we look at the entire, um, kind of uh, total cost of the project, it's actually much more worthwhile to do some of the preliminary work and only then to crowdsource than try to crowd, crowdsource it first. And uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Patrick and our team that has uh, a lot of experience in telling us what, what w would work, what's not, but in most cases it just you can apply uh, logic. Um, Kind of assemble intelligently is this is basically don't give them uh, you know the entire data set of possible outcomes. Uh, it goes back to the same point. And the last I mentioned, more bad data does not equal uh, better data. Um, that's all for us, and we can have last question. Just before the question phase, in order you know for Patrick and I um, to be able to say that we did our job right. We just want to mention that LinkedIn is hiring, uh, hiring <laughs> everyone at anyone is like in every position. I don't care who you are, what you do, we're probably hiring in, in that position. So just uh, please um, sh uh, connect with me or Patrick on LinkedIn, better with me so I can get the bonus. But uh, <laughs> And just uh, shoot us an email and we'll uh, pass it through. Yes, questions for me or Patrick. So what did you end up doing for the seniority? Um, so we, we, we started with uh, the recommendation as a kind of bootstrap, uh, another, uh, uh, to, to bootstrap the learning phase, and then we uh, gave it to uh, the, ta uh, the Turkers to act kind of multiple choice. We gave them, is this person and multiple list of seniorities? Because one of the problems with seniority that we didn't touch here is sometimes people have uh, multiple uh, profiles. Uh, but basically, uh, we used uh, both um, uh, both our uh, kind of inferred seniority based on the recommendation graph, and also uh, the answer we g given by the Turkers. Patrick, you want to say anything else about it? I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh, quite a good question. How do you guys decide how much is okay to spend on crowdsourcing for a particular project? Well, I can tell you my view is uh, since Patrick is doing all the work, so you know the longer the better, and <laughs> but it's better. Uh, uh, the real answer is that uh, the amount you spend on crowdsourcing is a small piece. I mean, it may not even be compared to the amount of time that you have your team of data scientists working with this data set. You spend you know five hundred bucks, even a thousand bucks on the crowdsourcing. It's like it's a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of time that uh, your team is actually using. Are you reporting something like um, this person is likely a good customer or a good prospect? Is there some way to use these techniques for that? 
the question is if we're looking at are people a good customer a good customer for me for you yeah, for Yeah, that feels like a hard problem. Um, <laughs> you guys like it, hard problems. Yeah, well, no, I hate hard problems. I only like easy ones. Um, I know. So once upon a time, I tried to sell crowdsourcing, and every customer is a unique snowflake that looks different and needs different things. And maybe crowdsourcing is special, but um, I don't know that we have anything like that in the pipeline. But you should join us and build it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's actually part of my team works on the our higher education stuff. Um, so we have, uh, like I talked, first example is uh, kind of school centerization because uh, we uh, need to know what schools there are. Uh, you know, one can write Stanford University, the other Stanford, and basically uh, at the very basic level is the data cleaning operation of uh, understanding and also understanding that the uh, GSB and Stanford are some, uh, somehow related. On top of that, we also, for uh, students that want to kind of find where to go to school, we have similar schools. The uh, same way we have similar profile and similar jobs. So if you're interested, again, in Stanford, we can say, okay, Berkeley and UCLA, for example, uh, can be also viable school. And we can, uh, we also try to do it not just, you know, on a very top, a top level school, but also based on uh, your field of study. So if you want to go to en engineering, then the schools are that are similar to Stanford are different than if you want to learn medicine. and. Um, what other uh, notable notable alumni? Uh, I, I, um, I don't know if you saw, but that was uh, also a, a project we did. You can go to your school now, and you can see who are the notable alumni. Did we use crowdsourcing? We did. We, so we actually use crowdsourcing to understand who are the notable alumni, and we will be. We have kind of large part of the data science team working on this new initiative. Wow, it's a, it's a great question. I, I think today the data science team at LinkedIn is, I think, a little bit more than 50 people. Um, unfortunately, I don't know all of them, um, but I think we have uh, one or two that come from this background. Um, the person who uh, runs our actually business analytics group, uh, who also are called data scientists, he actually was a, a brain surgeon and he decided to convert to a data science. <laughs> I think the story behind it is that he found out that what he likes best uh, uh, about uh, brain surgery is actually the data aspect of it. And so he just decided to do it full time and without cutting people. Um, so we're, yeah, I think we're open and we're uh, definitely starting hiring more uh, people that come from physics background. There is some level of statistics that is necessary to be able to perform the job, but we're definitely interested in uh, exploring kind of new uh, professions and field of studies uh, to make our team more diverse. And uh, I have a social science degree, and the director of the data science group is an econ guy too. So, yeah, so there are people. They're not all computer scientists like Vitaly. No, no one's awesome. perfect. Is it possible to be successful uh, going into data science if you don't have uh, uh, like a mathematics background? If you, didn't, if you didn't go to school for math, you just, you know, is it possible to break into that field or is it just like lost cause? Uh, if you can convince someone you're a crowdsourcing expert, uh, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's hard to say. I, I, so 
a lot of our people are not uh, math uh, majors, but they're kind of computer science. So there is some element of math just because it's kind of related to computer science and not just because we're looking for plain, uh, plain math. So there are a lot of you know, statistical uh, elements to our job. But to be honest, uh, we, are, we don't really care now at our hiring stage exactly what you did at school because you know, there are better, better signals uh, to do. And if someone, for example, you know, uh, has a, a done great stuff elsewhere, and we have uh, people that we hire because they did some awesome visualizations, and you know, uh, they were uh, or are data scientists. Uh, at LinkedIn. So basically, if you can do neat stuff with data, we don't really care what you went to school for. <coughs> yes. I think the question is about sort of career paths, right? Yes. Um, it, it gets back to that standardization problem, title standardization. I mean, yeah, fields of study are relatively standardized, but to track someone's or compare paths through a career across a lot of different people, um, I think the big challenge there is is standardizing titles to know that you know a senior software developer is not that different from a software engineer to um, and those sorts of problems. Um, I, th I think that was your question. I think we kind of punted it because we haven't standardized the titles well enough to uh, to do that yet. Yeah. I, I think I can also add that again that might sound a little bit PR-y, but we do believe in it, and a lot of the people that work on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn's mission is like to become the career portal, uh, you know, for everyone. So we believe that you should go to LinkedIn for anything that related to your career and our influencer uh, stuff was you know, a big part of it. So uh, we're definitely thinking about you know, how uh, to be more, uh, to have more and more opportunities. Uh, and a lot of them are using beta products in order to kind of make people, uh, to help people make better choices in their career is uh, just, we haven't reached, uh, you know, the full uh, capabilities and potential of w w what we can do. But definitely, we're thinking about it. Maybe I'm kind of missing something, but it seems like um, the issue of titles, like once you like regex and replace VP with, you know, vice president, you do the simple stuff like that. There wouldn't seem to be more than a few tens of thousands of variations or unique titles. Um, would it be Just kind of curiosity, how how many different titles um, you think LinkedIn data sets have? How many unique titles? Tens of thousands? Well, well it's, I mean, yeah, it's about three orders of magnitude. It's more. In LinkedIn, we have, if I'm not, uh, well, correct me if I'm wrong, 17,000 different names for the company IBM. 17,000 pe people have managed to enter a unique name for the company, a company that has three letters in it. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, so actually our first, our first uh, title standardization uh, effort that we call title standardization V1 was actually generated in kind of ontology of titles and using regular expressions and that was kind of um, carrying us so far, but we have, if I'm, again, if I'm not mistaken, tens of millions of different titles. So, and yeah, I'll, 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 this um, regex approach, um, I think, cover gives us coverage of about twenty percent of them, unfortunately. Yes. So um, these um, these conversions, it sounds like your machine out algorithms are using that, but do you actually go back and provoke the author to say, please change your title to be 
I kept seeing a consistent approach, like your machines are giving a luxury to see. Uh, I might do a better job sifting myself. Do you ever go back and update profiles? So we are not updating profiles for users. Um, but definitely, you know, each time you enter a, a new position, then we will try to do our best in order to, you know, to make you feel a standardized uh, title. And you write that maybe kind of in a cognitive sense, pay people after ha being on one platform and seeing the same title over and over again. But, you know, for example, um, I don't know if anyone work here at Yahoo, there's this member of the technical, uh, sorry, technical Yahoo or some companies, have, you know, just call themselves member of the technical staff. And there is just some culture that is probably you won't be able to change uh, just by having other people uh, write different uh, names for the same title. Most of the uh, uh, LinkedIn market is based in the US, and maybe countries that speak English. But the problem is that what I saw is that when titles actually was written in a different language than English, when people come by LinkedIn, they basically, I'm not sure if they actually come up with a title that they like, or so did you face kind of problems when the actual title uh, not in English so is the question is if someone, let's say, uses the French version of LinkedIn and wants to input an English title, uh, do we? Do you allow them first that they, they input the uh, title in their original language or has so, to be in English? So actually, if I'm not mistaken, we allow for two versions of your entire profile, am I right? So you yeah. can you can have a profile in two different languages here. Uh, original language and an English profile, and we will uh, do the matching. So you can. So if a person speaks English, he will see your English title, and he if he speaks French, for example, he will, uh, or not speaks French. Basically, using the French version of LinkedIn, we'll see the French page of your profile. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you guys.